So uh, thank you for having me here today. Um, and I'll be sharing this work that I started. So I started studying China about five years ago. And um, this was the initial work. Um, and afterwards, I started focusing on other aspects of Chinese um, economy. And just recently, I came back to this work to look at the philosophy, traditional Chinese philosophy, uh, specifically Confucius, and how it's impacting the Chinese international relations and Chinese you know, international political um, economic strategy. So, um, okay. Um, so it's undeniable today that the influence of China is becoming gradually more visible. And there is a whole debate of whether or not China has a model of modernization that it wants to present as an alternative to the Western model of um, development. So uh, the question that I'm asking here, uh, mm, confronting this debate, is whether this model of the Chinese model is an alternative to the Western model, or is just another model where we are trying to tell other countries to emulate our own behavior. Um, and um, in that regards, it's just uh, the same idea of emulation, of replication of one specific ideal with new, a new guise. So it's not really new ideas, it's just a new phase, face to the same kind of model of development. Um, maybe I should give you some background here. So there is, uh, development theory was created mostly after World War II. And uh, was the idea that how do we deal with the countries that are lagging behind? And um, the Western model thought, okay, we need to create um, economic ideas that will replicate our way of introducing market institutions to our economy in other countries. And uh, initially, development theory was uh, just one model fits all. And there was a lot of debate, several different schools of thought that were saying, you know, it needs to be specific. Each country is in a different level of development, has a different culture. Uh, so we can't have one theory, one model that applies to everybody. However, the people who had that idea of specificity uh, lost the debate. And uh, we had models, um, different ones, that are models where we use um, one, one size fits all ideas, um, implementing institutions and policies in all different countries without consideration of their historical specificity. So here is the question that I'm asking in this paper is uh, the Chinese model, is it different than that? Is China open to the idea that we need to be concerned with historical specificity or uh, not, and is it willing um, instead to Im impose its own model into other countries? So that's the question. Um, in order to answer the question, I went uh, to understand a little bit about uh, Chinese traditional philosophy. Um, the background and this is both, um, so giving an idea here of um, what is going on, but also the people that, oh, it didn't change the slide. Uh -uh. Space. Okay, use the score here. Oh, there you go. It worked, yeah. Okay, thank you. This one is okay? Yeah, thanks. 
So here on the background, um, this gives a little bit um, a context of what is going on now, but the papers that I'm citing also gives a theoretical context uh, of the paper. So um, initially here uh, we have Fraser, who is a feminist institution, a feminist uh, um, uh, institutionalist, and she has this idea that the Western model of development is suffering a generalized crisis, an economic, political, ecological, and sociological crisis. So we need to rethink our, our way of uh, provisioning our material, for, uh, how to continue our material provisioning. Um, Asian, Asian countries have successfully pursued their own model of development since the 1980s. We see with uh, especially uh, South Korea, but uh, all the Asian tigers that have first initially started with uh, export industrialization, uh, export growth um, strategy. And then afterwards, but at the same time, doing very deep uh, reforms in their economy in terms of education and um, uh, land reform, so uh, property of land, that really brought the country up to one of the countries that um, has one of the highest uh, GDP per capita. And China. Um, in its own way, is also following uh, this model. However, without uh, completely embracing capitalist relations of production. So here, with Sheng, I have uh, this is an institutionalist economist, and then Ahig, he is uh, a Marxist that looks at world system analysis. So it's a, a Marxist that is focused with in international relations and understanding how we reproduce um, uh, hierarchies in the geopolitical system. And um, so for what Ahig says, is, well, China tried for many years to just not um, introduce capitalist relations of production while introducing market-oriented reforms. And a lot of the literature that uh, looks at China has a hard time to say, is China a socialist country? Is China a capitalist country? Is it a socialist market? We're not going to get into this question because actually what I'm presenting in this paper is that China does not fit this Cartesian uh, model of dichotomies. And um, um, so if we try to fit China in our Western mind, we're not going to be successful. So I'm, I'm going to explain a little bit uh, that too in this paper, how um, for us it looks like it's contradictory. But for China, view, given that they have a uh, philosophy that is very uh, pragmatic uh, and very flexible. It uh, allows, f it, it doesn't need to follow these dichotomy classifications, dichotomous classifications. Okay, so um, why, why are so many people yeah, the computer <laughs> does what it wants. Let's see. Ah, okay. There you go. Okay, so uh, why are we so focused in chi on China lately? I mean, um, I have been writing papers and every, every month there are a huge amount of new papers that we need to, we need to read to keep uh, updated in the subject. So, uh, of course, China has experienced uh, very fast growth. In, um, in a matter of uh, 10 years, it's moved from the 10th to the second largest economy in the world. And in 2020, it produced $14 uh, trillion worth of GDP. Uh, the, GB, the GDP per capita is still very low compared to uh, the US, for example, so China has a GDP per capita of $10.5 thousand uh, dollars a year, uh, whereas the US, um, the number is 63.5 
thousand dollars per year. Um, but uh, China has successfully basically eliminated uh, poverty in the country. Uh, this is the World Bank that says that only 0.6% of Chinese population live below the poverty uh, line um, in, in 2016. In the US, they use different measurements, so we need to, that's why I didn't add the number here for the US because the methodologies of measurements are different, but in the US it's about 13%. It's just to give a sense of comparison. And um, the Gini coefficient in China has decreased a lot. So the Gini coefficient measures a little the level of inequality uh, in terms of distribution of income. And China um, in 2000, 2009, it was about uh, uh, 48. And right now it's 38.5. The lower the number, the more equal is the society. The US is the most unequal developed country and it has a Gini coefficient of 41.4, uh, 41.4, it's an index, so it's not a percentage. And here in this graph, uh, these are forecasts of when China is going to surpass uh, the US in terms of GDP. So um, you see here the forecasts that are around uh, 2027, 20, the, the GDP in China will be higher than that in the US. All right, so now that we have this introduction a little bit of the Chinese economy and uh, where it fits in the broader uh, changes that we are seeing in our system. Uh, we needed to look a little bit at the philosoph philosophical level what is happening in China right now. With uh, Xi Jinping, we, are, we have a change in the way in which China looks at itself. So uh, he believes that China, uh, he, he wants to put in value the traditional uh, philosophy of China. And uh, in 2019, I went to China and I talked to, I did a, a sociological methodology that is called um, participatory observation. So I went to China, I spent a month there and I talked to people uh, to, have, to have a sense of how people live their lives. It's a little bit like what the old philosopher did, right? I sat on the parks, I watched people a little bit and I talked to them and, um, and a lot of them told me uh, before, well, I had a limit at this point. Well, I still have, I, I have been studying Mandarin, but I didn't speak, so I, I was limited to the people who spoke English, unfortunately. Um, but uh, the people that I have talked to, they said, oh, before I, I felt I didn't want to, like, I wasn't proud of my country, but now I'm so happy uh, that I'm, I'm part of uh, China and that um, we have this rich culture, this millionaire uh, civilization, etc. So really, and when we walk on the streets, there are several panels, like uh, um, the outdoors boards saying words of, uh, of um, reinforcement or, uh, you know, joy, harmony, diversity. So things that put in a very positive gaze, words that are part of Confucius theory. Uh, or uh, philosophy. So that was interesting too, to see how the government is using uh, Confucius um, philosophy to ha make people have this positive uh, view of their own future, but also of what they belong to. So the sense of identity, right? And in a very positive way. Um, and as I said, um, this, the, the Chinese um, philosophy is very pragmatic, very flexible, and that does not subscribe to opposites. 
So they believe that the role of institutions, uh, no matter if they are political, economic, um, or social, cultural, is to combine soft and hard power. So in a way, culture has a strategic role for um, Chinese policy making and um, yeah, for Chinese policy making. All right. So I talked a little bit about. So um, now we are going to get into the more um, theoretical core of the paper, and um, I talked a little bit about how the um, about development theory, right? So until from World War II to the 2000s, there were two main models of development. One was the export-oriented growth, and the other one was the important substitution, uh, um, which would be we, we import capital goods in order to be able to um, develop our industry, and um, stop. The, the goal was to stop uh, importing consumer goods from abroad, so we can start producing consumer goods in these countries, we're going to do an import substitution strategy, and uh, that way, in the future, we won't be, we won't need to import goods from abroad or capital from abroad. Both models, did, uh, in general, were not uh, successful in sustaining development for a long period of time. Uh, they were tested in different areas. Uh, Latin America, for example, tried both models and um, it was, I mean, didn't arrive at uh, sustainable development with either. And so in the year 2000s, there was a general agreement that neither of these two models was, uh, were, um, were good for our policy implementation. So the IMF and the World Bank um, it started looking at institutions, and uh, however, from the, among institutionalists, there are several different, uh, and we, we are going to see here uh, two of them, even in this slide, there are different views, right? There is the new institutionalist theory. What, what does that mean? It's not a very uh, um, strong shift from the ideas, the, the previous ideas. However, we look at institutions. So um, what it means is that they will say economic growth, in order to have economic growth, so development and economic growth are viewed as the same thing. Um, and in order to, and this is controversial, I hope that my tone of voice <laughs> makes that clear. Uh, yeah, that development and growth is the same, um, the same thing. And uh, in order to promote economic growth, what we need is to build market institutions in these countries. So in a way is we reproduce, we implement market institutions that exist in Europe in, in the US into these countries. And if they do it well, uh, they are going to experience economic growth. And, experience, uh, and economic growth will uh, promote economic development without any other policy necessary. I mean, why just economic growth doesn't say anything about distribution of income. It doesn't say anything about education, right? You can have economic growth with a huge uh, level of inequality. So um, this is why it's a little bit uh, uh, problematic to equate the two uh, nowadays. I mean, uh, I'm not going to get into that debate. But nowadays, it's problematic to equate the two. And the, uh, also, the new institutionalist theory is not a paradigmatic uh, change or shift, because still we are imposing Western institutions um, as a one-size-fits-all solution, no, no matter where we are implementing these changes. So um, the 
institutionalism that I think is sensitive to the question of specificities, historical, cultural specificities, is the old institutionalist economics. And that's what I use in the paper. And they will criticize the new institutionalist theory in th um, three points. The first one is that they say uh, that the now institutionalism fails to really uh, offering a framework that can understand and promote development because it's not um, observing the dynamics of transformation of institutions. Why is that important? Once we implement, and we have seen that historically, once we try to implement an institution in another country, there are reactions. And this leads to results that are different than the uh, desired outcomes. So people are not passive to institutions that are implemented from abroad, especially if they have no saying on what institutions are going to be implemented. So um, <clears throat> that's one of the, the, the issues. And then, so we needed to look at dynamics, how the, how agents interact with these institutions and therefore their interaction will result in the unfolding of history. So we needed to understand and take that into consideration, that interaction between a agents and a structure. And the other point that is very important is embeddedness. So understanding that these institutions, they are going to interact with existing institutions and both of them are going to be embedded into a social um, context, social, historical, and cultural context. So we need to be sensitive to that in order to understand how history unfolds in countries that are different than ours and try to uh, recommend policies or understand what is going on in those countries. And this is the case for China. We cannot understand China from uh, if we don't try to understand their history, their culture, and how they view themselves. Uh, so we need to really have that flexibility and look at these institutions as embedded into their history. So um, here, uh, I, I, in this part of the paper, I talk a little bit about how um, the, the markets, the market system. So I'll give you some context here for, for this idea. Um, this idea of embeddedness is promoted by uh, Poyeni. Poyen, uh, he talked about three fictitious commodities. We have labor, land, and money. Those are fictitious commodities. Um, why fictitious? Because he says we can, we can never transform these three, given their essence, we can never transform them 100% uh, into commodities. We can never commodify land, labor, and money 100%. Um, so there are fictitious commodities and history, according to Poyani, unfolds into moments where uh, the, the institutions around labor, land and, cap, uh, and money sorry, are uh, more liberalized and more market driven. And once we start liberalizing or uh, commodifying too much this three uh, elements, we, uh, society starts entering clash. We start putting into danger the uh, ethos of society, what keeps us together. And so then we retract and we create protectionist policies to decom decommodify a little bit those markets of those, those three commodities. And Poyeni views history going into this pendulum between liberalism and protectionism. And uh, well, in a way, this is, this is a dichotomous framework, right? Uh, because we only see uh, liberalism and protectionism, and we see the pendulum going from one side to the other. And this is problematic for understanding China. 
because um, even though China tried to protect the fictitious commodities from commodification, it doesn't mean that there was an absence of exploitation of these commodities. It doesn't mean that there was a, a lack of exploitation of these commodities. Quite the contrary. Several studies show, so um, probably you guys are not familiar with um, the system in China, because I had no idea most people that I talked to didn't know this uh, either. Um, there is a system in China called the Hoku, Hoku system which is basically a system of immigration inside the country. So if you are, if you are uh, from a family in a rural area, you have one RUCO um, number identification. And if you are from the um, uh, urban area, you have another one. And if you decide to migrate from a rural area to an urban area, you don't have any rights to your social benefits. So you don't have health care, you don't have free school to your kids, um, and um, you can easily be hired in very precarious situations as well um, because of this uh, identification system that was created during the planning system to make sure that China would have enough food and while it was trying to do the big push and uh, develop during the um, Mao's uh, period. But today, the government tries to make reforms about this. Um, several labor reforms have taken place. It's a little bit better, but it's still, the Hoku is still uh, is in is in place. It has been. It hasn't been eliminated. So um, you still have two classes of workers in um, in the country. So you have uh, that is one institution that allows exploitation of labor uh, that is not based on commodification. Um, you also have a huge difference in terms of uh, gender. Um, and you have uh, ethni ethni ethnical groups as well. Um, so in China, there are 55 et ethnic groups. And the Hang, uh, which is the dominant group, is 60% of the population. So we have 40% of the population that most of us have never heard about, that there are other 55 ethnicities in China. And so there is uh, other layers of exploitation that take place. So commodification and this pendulum between liberalism and protectionism is not able to take that into account. So um, uh, we need to reformulate a little bit Poyeni's ideas in order to be able to uh, consider that. And this is where the feminist economics enters. And, uh, and I'll explain that a little bit later. But feminist economics will say, look, there are other layers, and we needed to take that into account. So we are going to revise Poyen's framework in order to take those other layers into account and have a framework, a theory that is able to look at uh, the current crisis as a multi-dimensional crisis. So it applies not only to China, it applies everywhere. I mean, we know very well that gender inequality, ethnical inequality, uh, and uh, rural and uh, urban labor inequality hap exists everywhere. So uh, this is not, uh, this framework doesn't apply only to China, but here I'm using China as an example. Okay, so the second point, the second critique from the war, uh, old uh, institutionalist economics to the new institutionalist economics is exactly that idea of the pendulum, right? And so um, first they say it creates in false dichotomy between state involvement in the economy and the development of market institu institutions. Old institutionalists will say, look, if we look at the history of capitalism, 
the market and the national states, they were born together. This is part of the one, one history. So uh, making a dichotomy as if uh, liberal markets means no government is a false debate. Actually, liberal markets new, needs a liberal government, but it cannot exist without a government. So um, the and they will say this simplistic view of the dichotomy makes us have this linear teleological view of history as if there is only one possible way that history is going to unfold and is through the development of market institu institutions. That once everybody arrives at that goal, it's the end of history and we live in the ideal world. So that's the perspective of new institutional uh, economics, that market institution is a desirable outcome and is, is, is the end of history for ve several philosophical reasons that we can discuss later if you guys are interested. And uh, finally, uh, so these three points are connected. It, it, it leads economic theory to the inability to see other possible outcomes that history can unfold in a different way. And maybe the market uh, institutions and uh, cap liberal capitalism is not the end of history. And we can have something different. Um, and here I'm not talking about communism, but I'm saying we, it can be whatever it can be. We can have a new feudalist uh, era. We can have chaos. We can have uh, a different type of capitalism. There are several options. Uh, so having that idea that uh, if we look in human history, capitalism is a very short, exists for a very short period, 500 years. So uh, in uh, 10,000 <laughs> years, this is nothing. So um, we need to keep that in mind and be able to take that into account when we are thinking about institution transformation and social transformation. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, yes, as I mentioned before, this non-dichotomous uh, perspective is very useful for understanding China because there is this, um, this flexibility, experimentally oriented uh, state guidance. So a lot of times when China wants, when the government wants, the party wants to do a change, they will test it uh, in a small scale, and if it works, they will start expanding it. And they allow a lot of flexibility for the, for the private sector so that it, they can be creative, innovative. Uh, so, and at the same time, the party is trying to um, gain space in the international organizations. So uh, it's not uh, uh, one block, uh, we have an authoritarian government and people have no freedom for thinking and there is no creativity. This is not, um, it's not the way things take place in China. Um, okay. All right, the last critique um, of old institutionalist economics is that new institutionalist economic? Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, that's uh, quite, yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, no, you don't have to. It's good it's that it's, it was okay. only, okay. yeah. Anyway, oh, uh, and I, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> okay, well, since I had to go back, I want to talk about, I, I was hesitating, should I talk about it or not? The yin and yang, and then you see the hexagrams around it, or three grams around it. This is uh, based on the Book of Change, uh, I Ching, which was one of the, uh, apparently Confucius, he read, he read this book his whole life a hundred times. People say that's the only book he read. I doubt that that's the case, 
but uh, anyway, uh, that's why it's there. Um, uh, the I Ching. So it's the book of change, and it was a book that politicians in China used in order to strategize uh, how they would uh, deal with different conflicts. Um, so they would use this book. Anyway. All right, so the last point is the um, of critique of um, old institutionalist economics to new institutionalist economics is that, and this is not particular to new institution economics, but they focus only on the commodification of money. So we're only focusing on economic aspects in isolation, in a vacuum. And uh, most economists do that. However, it's important to understand that we should actually analyze the commodification of money in combination with the commodification of labor and in combination uh, with commodification of land. Because they also, they were all required for the market system to emerge as a dominant system. The commodification of these three fictitious commodity was, uh, were, uh, was necessary. So if we wanted to really understand the impacts of uh, um, changes in economics, we needed to understand them into com uh, in, in combined. And uh, so it's because of this overemphasis on money that uh, economists have a hard time to see the economic collapse and social and environmental crisis as part of the same process. Okay? In China, uh, the interconnection the interconnection has always been clear for them. Why? China is a country that has 3.7 million square miles. However, oh, occupied, uh, that's not updated because I looked at today's 1.4 million people. And uh, as I said, 55 different ethnicities, where only 15% of the land is fertile. So um, the, main, the main challenge for Chinese um, politicians since Confucius has been, if we unify the country, how do we maintain the union of this country that has this level of diversity, a huge population, huge ter terrain, however, with very little natural resources. So here we are talking about all the three points. We're talking about economics, we're talking about so money, land, and labor. Okay? So for China, uh, they could never uh, only look at one issue. Um, a lot of the politics nowadays, their idea is that in order to keep social conflict tamed, uh, you need full employment. So the solution is an economic solution for social tension. If you, the, in, their, in their perspective, the perspective of the party, is if people have access to what they need for their survival, so if they live well, we're not going to have issues of maintaining our country unified. If people are unhappy, we're going to start having issues. So uh, a lot of the politics is related to that. All right. So here is, this is the part of the paper that I just explained, where um, I'm justifying why we should use an uh, old institutionalist framework to understand China. And then the next portion of the paper, I say, uh, uh, but we needed to make a few changes to using feminist theory in order to, to really achieve the goals that I just um, described. So why? First, we needed to disconnect domination from commodification, because commodification is something specific to the market system. So if we want to be able to have a theory that can 
that opens the possibility for developments of other systems, our framework cannot be specific to the market system. So we are going to use exploitation rather than commodification. So that's the first change. Uh, the second change is the dichotomous perspective, right? We had, um, we see this view of public and private between market and government. So uh, the market, if we compare to the government, the market is private and the government is public. Now, if, uh, however, we're neglecting that the market, if we compare the market with the household, because economists ignore to all the economic activities that happen in the household, so childbearing, uh, cooking, cleaning, no matter taking your dog for a walk, uh, whatever, that's not economic activity because it doesn't have a market relation. So uh, you can see how for feminist economists this creates a problem because um, historically, I mean, this is somewhat changing, much less than what we think, but historically women are the ones who took more time in the household to do these activities. And so women, they, they have no relevance in economics because they don't leave the household, right? Nowadays, we leave the household. However, in a lot of countries, when, uh, when we look at the time use, that means the time spent working at home, women that are married in a country like France, I know I did this study um, uh, a couple of years ago, so I'm, I'm gonna remember more or less the numbers, but it was huge, the difference. So a couple uh, hit, uh, hit um, straight, to, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, 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 it's heterodox that is coming to my mind <laughs> because it's a heterodox economics. Uh, well, okay, a straight couple uh, where both work and that have kids they both work the same amount of hours out of the household in the household in France. The woman spends 30 hours per month, per week working at home and men 10. This is in France where I think there is some gender equality compared to other countries, but to give an idea that the gap is still huge. So if we don't take into consideration what is happening in the household, we are ignoring a huge amount of service that is being produced uh, that is not being counted. So feminist economists say, look, actually we need to also look at the market in relation to the household. And in that relationship, the market is public and the household is private. So now we have a double dichotomy. And when we look at that, we both both dichotomies, we have a multi-dimensional issue. So we cannot talk anymore about a pendulum that goes from one to another, but we have um, a multi-dimensional uh, framework of analysis. So that's the other change uh, proposed. And then finally, the third change is the idea that um, the first uh, economist that, uh, or I don't know if he was the first, but he's the one that I used here, um, Marx, um, is this idea that uh, marketization is not necessarily negative. So that we put, so if, if we want to, you know, we put this dichotomy between uh, markets and or liberalization and protectionism. And then um, new, new institutional economists will say, oh, liberalization is good, protection is bad. And then old institutionalists will say, no, protectionism is good, protectionism is good, liberalization is bad. And actually, uh, there are positive and negative sides for both things, right? And marketization, has emancipatory effects. So we need uh, as well to uh, take away this um, moral judgments between these two uh, extremes. Okay, so um, 
And so that's the framework that I'm proposing in order to understand the Chinese economy. Let me see how many minutes I already spoke. Uh, I already spoke for 40? 45 minutes? <laughs> okay, okay, okay. So, wow, I, I talk a lot. <laughs> okay. Um, what am I going to do? Because I cannot, so I, I will, I, I, you have 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Yeah, minutes. Okay, so. Okay. Well, <laughs> let me see what I think is the most important. Okay, since I spent a lot of time uh, talking about the theory, what I'm gonna do is show a little bit of Confucianism and how the theory applies to uh, this philosophy. And then uh, I will end and I hope we are gonna cover the rest in the discussion. So, uh, Confucianism is based on five main principles. Okay, so the vision of commonwealth. So that means that um, every action, every decision that we take, we shouldn't take it, uh, be based only in our self-interest, but we need to take the common well-being into consideration. So this gives a, um, a philosophy of life in China where people, be, for sure, they would think about uh, living well, but they they accept that um, that uh, this means having some con that they might be constrained because there is a greater good that we need to work towards, and that is a social good. Okay. Then the rule of v virtue. This is very um, it's um, very interesting in the Confucius uh, philosophy. So it's this idea that um, we have, there is a, tr a triad between nature, so nature, um, humans, and heaven. So there is a triad, heaven is the universe, it's, and, um, and the universe is perfect, is, it has this perfection, it's almost like this, yeah, it's heaven. Uh, and we are, these three elements, in essence, they are the same. So humans, they have that perfection in them as well. However, once we have this superior who, human that is uh, our pure form, however, once we are socialized, we tend to distance ourselves and become an inferior uh, version of ourselves because we are tempted for our desires in terms, especially they talk in financial, uh, monetary terms here. Um, and so um, our process is to try to bring ourselves closer to this essential self, which is away from um, uh, our self that is too concerned with material, material goods and material. Um, so that's the idea. And, uh, but, but it's not necessarily that we are looking, it's not the Buddhist way of thinking that, oh, we needed to find research deep in ourselves, you know, if I, no, it's just uh, having that virtue of accepting, um, n not getting rid of our selfish uh, desires, um, especially economic ones. It's basically that. And that's the big, the long path that we have to cross is the, the big water, he says. is the big water that we have to cross during our life. Now, only the most virtuous people should be part of the government. So that's the practice of meritocracy. 
And Confucius, today, uh, a lot of people think, oh, you know, Confucius, um, it was a conservative thinker because he thought there would be no social mobility and he thought people should accept uh, their situation. And that's not the case at all. Actually, Confucius, he believed in the role of education and he pushed for uh, having um, ways of um, measuring how, uh, how prepared people are so that these people could wo work in the government uh, regardless of which ethnicity they were from okay, or which uh, economic background they had. So he was actually a very progressive thinker, thinker for his time. We also needed to put the person in his time. He wrote, uh, he, he lived in the uh, fifth century before Christian era. So we can't like t talk about this person with our mentality of today and then say, yeah, he's conservative. Well, find, um, find me one philosopher in the five, uh, fifth century before Christian era that we don't find conservative today. Uh, that's my challenge to you guys. <laughs> anyway, and then once the government only has these people who deserve because they are the best prepared, most virtuous, less selfish people, uh, then we have a benevolent government and the government is looking at the interests of everybody. And finally, the fifth point important for Confucius is then the government should, uh, the mechanism of transition of power. So it should happen either by heredity or by abdication. Okay, so and he, he talks about a smooth process of uh, leading towards that. Okay, so um, yeah, uh, uh. maybe it's the slide uh, giving me a signal that it's time to stop talking. <laughs> ah. Okay, so uh, what I do then in the paper is to connect uh, these ideas of uh, commonwealth and meritocracy with the three fictitious commodities that we had uh, talked about. So here, when we look at commonwealth and meritocracy, we see um, a structure, a philosophy of division of labor and distribution of income, where there is social stability and harmony in mind. Okay, so it's not necessarily equitable, but it's, it's fair. And, um, and everybody has access to what they need. Okay, there is a hierarchy in the different types of jobs. So he, he believes that uh, agricultural, um, agricultural is less than manufacturing and, and is less than intellectual labor. And people's income is going to um, is going to reflect that hierarchy uh, to guarantee the best social outcome. So that's where people believe, say, like that's the the conservative side of Confucianism that people criticize uh, because it favors um, hierarchy, it favors social differences, it favors passivity. We accept our role and we accept that that's what is best for society as a whole. So, and the main objective is the harmony and acceptance of diversity. And this, in the discussion, I hope we're gonna have the chance. This applies also for China's role in international politics. So, you know, the, the view is not, okay, we're not gonna change countries to, for, so, so that they mirror what we are. But there is a hierarchy among countries, um, and there is this harmony in, within diversity. So there is, a, there is positives and negatives of this. Okay, the rule of virtue, so people um, looking to go from their inferior self to their superior self, thank you. 
Um, so, as I said, the path of the universe is sacred, noble, perfect, selfless, and impartial. So the universe is uh, perfect. Nature, uh, nature phenomena, and all beings, they do not have an independent value in themselves. They have a value in terms of the fact that they are part of the universe and they have that perfection, nobility, uh, selflessness in them. And so uh, the laws of the universe and humanity and nature are interconnected. Okay? So as I mentioned, it's, um, we have our celestial selves, our pure selves, in contrast to the real selves who have been affected by the pursuit of satisfaction of our desires. So uh, this means that we have been degraded by our experience and we need to uh, rejuvenate ourselves to become a virtual person. This applies to China, so as the development of the country. This applies not only to individuals, but it applies to countries, it applies to institutions, it applies to all different dimensions that we can think of. So uh, they would say China also, Xi Jinping has in his discourse, China also has to rejuvenate itself uh, because it has been degraded for several reasons. And then here, the final slide connecting the three fictitious commodities and um, Confucianism is still related to um, the rule of virtue. So even though... Uh, no, we did, we did, it's just they look very similar. <laughs> <laughs> And um, the, the, um, which is the role of humanity in this, in, in this process. So uh, humans have a very special role in, in forming institutions and in protecting the environment, the plants, animal things in general, um, through the construction of these institutions. So um, there, there is a part of uh, now is Confucianists that talk about uh, con this philosophy maybe being something more less uh, anthropocentric and something that can be more environmental oriented because uh, it takes into consideration that we are part of nature and that we in this we have a role of protecting um, nature. Um, and um, yeah, so I think, I'm sorry that I didn't um, finish. I prepared too many slides. <laughs> Probably I would speak for several hours if I covered all my slides. Uh, but we can clearly see, so just to give some conclusion, we can clearly see in the discourse of Xi Jinping and in the different strategies for both domestic policy and international policy, uh, how it's being influenced by Confucianism. And even the image that uh, Xi Jinping wants to pass across, that is China wants to be, have an important role, but not through violence, not through imposition, but because it is its role to play in the, in the history of humanity. So there you go. Uh, thank you, and again, I'm sorry I, I prepared too many slides. Uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Professor Bakarinci, for the very exciting presentation. I do feel that your comments and your research will dialogue quite well with what we're going to present today, because as you have focused on the theory of development and how development also has to be rethought in order to understand China, we will also focus on that rethinking of economic policy and of development to understand the kind of domestic and in international implications of Chinese development, both for China but also for developing countries in the global south. Um, so we will be presenting a short comment in this paper that we have just seen the presentation by Professor Bacarenzi, and we would like to focus basically on this term here, the Chinese dream, the unfolding of it. In a sense, 
uh, the argument that we will be putting forward is that to understand terms like the Chinese dream, uh, Chinese um, socialism with Chinese characteristics, the Chinese model, we have to rethink and adopt a new mentality towards development. And this is exactly what we will do by understanding how can Confucian thought actually contribute to that. So to start with this short comment, we will start with a sentence that also dates back to Confucius. Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the sentence is, uh, "Zhi zhi wei zhi zhi, bu zhi wei bu zhi, shi zhi ye." <laughs> and I think with that we can go to the next slide, <laughs> which will actually contribute to us to understand that this sentence means that real knowledge is to know the extent of one's ignorance. Um, for five seconds, maybe when you saw this sentence, definitely it was like, "What is this?" What exactly are we talking about? I don't understand what is said there. Um, I would really just like to focus on the word ignorance. This part of the sentence here, it really says about the understanding of what wisdom is. This part actually refers to the idea that not knowing is also knowing. But in a sense, there's no reflection to ignorance in that, which means that the translation of the sentence does not fully comprise and does not fully comprehend the meaning of that Chinese saying. And our topic of the presentation today will be exactly that. That when we're looking towards another country, when we're looking to China, we have to understand exactly what they're saying. And first of all, we also have to acknowledge what we don't know, so that we actually can start asking the right questions. And this will be what Ching Miao will do for the first part. <laughs> yeah. Uh, thank, thank you, Zhao, for, uh, for, for the introduction. And actually, just a second. This part, yeah. So, firstly, I'm gonna have some initial remarks on the paper. Uh, this paper uses a feminist institutionali institutionalism analysis uh, on the structural aspects of the Chinese domestic uh, development and international development, development with its roots with Confucianism. And this goal is to articulate an open ended framework with the it, which escapes viewing the Western development mo model as an imperative destination, rather fearing the embedded, embedded cultural traditions of China. Which I think this kind of, like in my view, this kind of research is very appreciated because it cannot talk about developments with, without consi the consideration of culture, political and uh, social conditions. So. This is one of the extracts which we, we, we chose the from the paper and you also already uh, talked about it, about the Chinese dream, about the combination of soft and hard power and uh, the path of modernization for China lies on Chinese traditions. So I'm not going to read this, I, I'm not go going to read this quote, but I'd like to highlight that, yes, with like thousands of years history of China, we cannot ignore the culture aspect when we think of its development and uh, yeah. So in our presentation, we are going to, after the introduction, we are going to, uh, I'm going to talk about the, some of the traditional roots of Chinese economic thought and this actually uh, echoes, echoes what Professor Brackas Brackerens has talked about in her presentation, and then Zhao will talk. Uh, will introduce the Im its implications on Chinese international development, and then we will end with some concluding remarks. Uh, <laughs> so, when we when we talk about mm, the Chinese traditional values and uh, the ancient ph philosophy. Uh, it's sometimes it's very hard to keep uh, objective, as one, it, one reason is that there are so many of it, and we often like people, including researchers and the and the government itself, chooses to like highlight some of it, which they wanted to see, but ignore the rest of it. But it is the whole, like all of the values that it that shaped 
the Chinese people and also the Chinese society today. So my aim here is not to provide a comprehensive analysis introduction on the traditional value, but only like show some of my <laughs> subjective uh, interpretation of some of the values I think is very interesting. Yeah. Uh, uh, to, to, to interpret uh, the economic thoughts of ancient Chinese philosophers, the first thing we got to know is that the concept of economics back in China in that time is not the same as what we have today. Um, not the same, at least with the neoclassical economics. <laughs> yeah, so there is no discipline of economics in China before. And it was introduced to China in the 1980s. Um, and at that time, people were discussing about what the translation of economics should be in China. And there are mainly two proposals. The first one is <laughs> Li Cai. It, like literally, it means the management of money and wealth. And the second one is which is the one we, we are currently using. And it's mainly is the management of the state and policy for people. So from this part, we can see that actually in China, if you are going to talk about economics, it, you cannot leave the uh, culture, social conditions, and the people, the state away from it. It's part of the economic study. And uh, with this in our mind, I'm going to show like two two examples, which I find is very interesting. The first one is the uh, is the Taoism. Uh, the core value of Taoism is to govern the state with no action or no intervention. It sounds familiar, right? It, at least it re it reminds me of the liberalism, <laughs> and. Yeah, and also many scholars would argue that, yes, it is very, it, it's just corresponding to the uh, laissez-faire. Uh, but if you think of it in the context of the feudal society, actually there's no action or no, no intervention is for those uh, emperor, for emperors and for the privileged group. Because he proposed here, Taoism proposed here is that the privileged group should not intervene in the life of the normal citizens because they do not they do not know what is good for them, but they should leave them alone and to to do what they think is good for them. And that's but it just this proposal is not enough. So how would, how would Taoism cons convince the governors, the, the emperors to to follow his idea. So here he, he uses the difference uh, uh, self-desire, which he thinks that uh, governors and emperors and the privileged group should not pursue the excessive material desire, which is what we have seen in the previous presentation. And instead, they should pursue the uh, spiritual desire which normally means things like happiness, things like doing something good for the society, for the common good. And so this is what I would say, yeah, it's, it's not governing the, uh, the state or governing the economy with economic solutions, but with the culture and philosophical f f f philosophies that's embedded in people's mind. And another one is the Confucianism, which we talk a lot about. And I would like to talk about the evolving of Confucianism. And yeah, we talk about the meritocracy and the, the acknowledge of like you have your own position in the society. And there is a di kind of hierarchy of occupation and uh, kind of acknowledge the inequality in the society that people are not equal, at least uh, from your ability or your intelligence. But also we see another, like in the time of the ev evolution of Confucianism, we also see that people, uh, 
this quote, like people who own the countries and lands worry more about inequality than inefficiency, more about instability than uh, insufficiency. So we see that equality is also important in this point of view. So it's very hard to tell like which is the dominant role. It really depends on the context of, of the, like the time. So we can see from this evolution of this philosophy that actually it's the, we can see from it's the pragmatism that the philosophers are using, like trying to solve the real, real issue of the society. And also what the communist, the party in China is also doing the thing with the, this traditional value. They, they say that we should take the essence and discard the drags. Like we should use those that are benefits to, to us, use the values that we uh, treasure now. Yeah, so then I will lead it to Joao to talk about the implications. Yeah. Thank you, Shim Yao. Um, yeah, I do feel that after we have acknowledged our ignorance, now we can actually confront it and try to understand what kind of implications we can draw from that in order to understand how can we understand that China model, what exactly is the Beijing consensus and those expressions that may actually be full of sense or maybe also be empty sometimes. Um, so the roots of a China model, that's exactly the term that Natalia, Professor Brocadense uses in her paper, uh, instead of using the Beijing consensus, which is kind of a more uh, liberal understanding of how China actually rose. Um, and we would like to go back to the literature on this. Actually, this is a book that has recently been launched, How China Escaped Shock Therapy. And the idea that China escaped shock therapy twice, um, but actually that it did so by choosing experimentalist uh, ideas and experimental gradualism. That's exactly, exactly the term that uh, Professor Isabella Weber will use by understanding that um, there was no such easy way out of shock therapy. But shock therapy was escaped by actually following a route which is in, uh, very highlighted within this uh, specific sentence, which the idea that you have to cross the river by dropping the stones. You don't cross the river, a river by actually finding the way and then just finding the, the easiest way to cross the river. But you change the order of the stones so that you can actually find a way. You maybe go back sometimes because you see that this way is a little bit more complicated than the other, but actually there is a, a possibility of pragmatism and, and gradualism in it. It's not about the pace, it's about the setting of the policy. And in this, we would like to highlight pragmatism, stability, and traditions as main basis of what was the idea of the party state in that transition in the 1980s. Um, and Professor Weber will also highlight the importance of Confucianist thought, basically within the uh, book called Guanxi, which is nece not necessarily a Confucianist book, but is a book which draws from Confucianist tradition in order to understand what are the important sectors in the economy. So there is this concept of heavy light, uh, sectors and the heavy sectors would not be subjected to the kind of control of uh, the market pricing si uh, system. While the light system, the light prices, which will be determined by markup and determined by the kind of importance that it has in the uh, life of the everyday people, then these prices um, will actually be available for uh, market pricing. So there is a need of like also stability in that sense. And um, the dual track price system, which is exactly the idea of the heavy light systems and what how is the reform actually going to take place? And the household responsibility system, which is basically the main uh, change in land distribution within China, but not necessarily land distribution, but also with the including of incentives after um, 1978. These were the two alternatives which were set by the party state in order to, uh, in to start actually reforming the economy in towards a market uh, economy. But then we have the quote also from Deng Xiaoping, which is in which is in a sense, uh, it is kind of illustrating uh, market pragmatism because it really doesn't matter if the cat is white or if it's black, as long as it catches mice, then in a sense that cat is a good cat. So in a sense, um, it, it doesn't mean that, like, doesn't matter if it's capitalism or socialism, this is not what we are talking about. And exactly the uh, point that Professor Brocarinsen made, it doesn't really, the question whether China is socialist or capitalism doesn't matter. What actually matters is that when we are trying to look to China, we have to see that kind of tradition that is there behind. And this is 
crossing the river by grabbing the stones. This is also the understanding that Confucianist uh, rules also play a very important part, but it's still a communist dictated state in a sense. And, uh, and, that, and for this reason, all those things are kind of a paradox. If we look to it from a Western perspective, but if we try to look China for what it is, then the paradox can actually be seen as a reality in a sense. Um, so if we want to do, and already take into the conclusions, if you want to find a Beijing consensus, we may not find it, because as the Washington consensus has actually been established and, and actually been a, fail, a failure, the Beijing consensus does not imply a set of rules and a set of conditionalities that these institutions of Chinese multilateralism will um, reinforce. But they will actually reinforce the fact that there was a model of development established in China. And with Xin Miao, we were discussing about it, and we do also agree with Professor Bracarensi about the word of a China model. Um, and this exactly is embodied by the institutions such as the Belt and Road Initiative, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, the New Development Bank. But these institutions, looking to them in a Western perspective and seeing that China is going to reform and reshape um, the world economy by actually proposing a Beijing consensus, they also highlight the extent of our ignorance. So we have to look at them by what they are. We have to study them and we have to understand what kind of institutionalities are there behind them. And I really like this quote, which is one of the texts that you actually suggested to us, that the China model uh, cannot be t can be taught as a speech act, and that defining it and talking about it makes it real and gives it real power. So um, we say that the China model would be, can be actually decided on, going back to the uh, Professor Weber's text, that it is about experimental gradualism and pragmatism in development. But can we actually copy the Chinese experience for countries in the global south? What are the implications for development today? And with that, we can go to the conclusion. Uh, moving beyond the, our ignorance, we have acknowledged, we have confronted, and now we actually want to know what can we do to go beyond the, the ignorance. And we will go back to Confucius, this time in English, so that we can actually understand that there is an exchange between what we ask and what we get. And he who asks, as he who asks is a fool for five minutes, but he who does not remains a fool forever. And asking the questions is the first step so that we can actually understand what can we not know and what can we know. But we always have to remind ourselves that there, there's also this other part, the part that we can never see. And exactly having the understanding that when we don't ask, this sentence is also very badly translated. And in a sense, what we know and what we would like to highlight in this part, in this short comment, and we have done so, I think, is that there's always something that we will not be able to grasp. That's not a problem. This is part of our limitations. And by being aware of it, then we can actually get to ask the right questions and go beyond our ignorance. Uh, just to finish, to find off, my, maybe we'd like to pose some questions concerning the China model. Um, in the last sentence of the paper, Professor Bacarense says that if China, here, if domestic China is far from achieving the age of peace, internally evidence of the movement is in the, uh, is this direction is even less evident in that sense. So like, since China has not achieved a harmonious society internally, then externally when it's trying to build Chinese multilateralism, it's going to be very hard. And we would really like to emphasize and question maybe this if. This is a big if, and this is exactly what exactly the, the Chinese model may be lacking, and we could put some questions forward concerning that. What are the conditions for this big if, both for internal and external uh, concerns in China? Uh, what exactly means achieving an age of peace? Um, is China actually aiming to build a convergent international arena? These are questions that we would like to pose. And in order to beyond, go beyond our ignorance for the five minutes, and actually not remain fools for life, then we would like to ask two questions. Um, the first one was uh, suggested by Xin Miao, and how does this institutions of this Chinese multilateralism, like the Belt and Road Initiative, the, the two development banks that we mentioned, how do they embody the notion of an unfolding Chinese dream? How those policies and those institutions also reflect that kind of Confucianist and that kind of, of international relations concerns of China? And the second relates a little bit more to the shock therapy argument. If deviating from neoliberalism was a need for development in, in the South, and it's still a need in a sense, how can we actually go beyond the Chinese model? Because one thing that is really very clear from your argument is that we need to think of embeddedness and we need to think of traditional thought. 
But what is the case of Latin America, for instance? Should we go back to structuralism? Should we understand that our societies is also, um, they have a different working and, and then therefore they also need different theories? And yeah, if you have further questions to Professor Bracarensi so that we can actually escape our ignorance co collectively, then please do so. Thank you so much. Well, I want to say first that uh, it's very humbling. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's very humbling to have my paper analyzed by a Chinese student. <laughs> and I'm glad I didn't make any, uh, it doesn't seem like I made some huge mistakes, but of course I feel like understanding China would require many years of study and um, visits and as shown in the slides also uh, learn Mandarin because the translations are um, in general not, um, they don't reflect what uh, is being said. Um, I think, um, yeah, well, I, I, I thought that uh, the points brought up were very interesting and I, I like the idea of um, acknowledging uh, our ignorance um, and probably policy making would be much more um, efficient if we had the ability of doing that and um, giving, empowering people to talk about, to teach us and talk about their experience before we think we have the solution for all world's problems. Because um, I, I do think that in the post-war period that was one of the big issues in terms of international politics is that we come with a model and we think we are the owners of the whole truth and we don't listen to people in the ground, we don't listen their to their experience, and then we do uh, terrible mistakes, implement horrible institutions that are very unsuccessful. So um, I, I think uh, the line, uh, the, the treading line in the presentation, um, in the discussion is, is very important, acknowledging our ignorance and I mean, uh, I don't think that we can ever, uh, we can ever overcome it. Like, uh, the, it's the more, the more we, we look into things, the more we learn that we don't know. So, um, but uh, I think we can enlighten some points and, and searching that, I don't know what, uh, is the future you guys are looking for in your careers, but for sure searching that, uh, to try to shed some light of your own ignorance through your whole career, I think it's already like <laughs> amazing goal. Um, so I, out of out of the uh, other than that, uh, I I think the comments, the questions here. If I understand that this is for the students, for for the students, right? Yeah. So I'm gonna pass uh, the voice. <laughs> ah, it's for me. <laughs> okay. Let's see. Deviating from orthodox is needed for development in the global south, but it is possible. No, so I think the idea, so answering the second question first, uh, I think the idea exactly is that we sh uh, there is no, not one model that um, is the right model, right? And I, I think my provocative last sentence in the paper saying, well, uh, Ch China is still very far from uh, what Confucius called the age of peace, when we look in terms of labor, land, and capital, uh, and money, keep, I keep my uh, labor, um, labor, land, and money, uh, we see that there are still several issues, um, challenges that China has to overcome in order to arrive at the age of peace, 
which the, in your slide you also asked, what is the age of peace? Well, according to, um, to the philosophy, it would be a point where, where everybody has access to what they need. They are, they are happy, content in uh, their positions and they are serving. And of course, this is dynamic, right? But they are serving their institutions, being that the family, the, the economy, their uh, communities, uh, the country. Um, and there is no, so the idea for Confucius is that there is no conflict, right? That people, are, there is no internal conflict. I mean, Confucius is not thinking about China. China wasn't even unified at this point, and what his goal is exactly to unify the country. Uh, but so, yeah, that internally there is no conflict, and that would be the age of peace. Um, but I don't think that um, that replicating is possible in other places or, or desirable. And China has this discourse that they don't want other countries to replicate, right? What, uh, what they want uh, is to be recognized for what they are, which is a milita millionary civilization that has their own, uh, their, their place in this world that should be central, but that doesn't mean that they are going to impose their institutions onto other countries. And so far, when we look at uh, foreign direct investment uh, promoted by China, in general, these are merely economic contracts and they do not impose structural changes to these countries. Uh, either politically or economically. It's a mere economic agreement with, okay, this is how much we are lending and this is how much you're paying back. Um, so in a way it is, uh, it, it is condescent with what they are, are saying, their discourse in that sense. Um, but yeah. Uh, to go back uh, to the idea of uh, my, my last sentence in the paper, I think um, that, uh, that internationally it's very far from, from reaching the point that, uh, that the party wants, which is a point of uh, acceptance, respect, and uh, centrality in the geopolitical and economic situation. Um, so I, I, to answer in one sentence, no, I don't think other countries need to replicate China or should. Um, I think um, for Latin America, for example, we see several <clears throat> countries that are looking to develop their own ideas of age of peace or that they will call the uh, bien vivir. Uh, so it's, uh, you, I think countries need to find, uh, to, 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 in a way, to find themselves and understand how they should develop from within based on what, what they have and without trying to copy and uh, emulate another country.